Welcome to How AI Happens, a podcast where experts explain their work at the cutting edge of artificial intelligence. You'll hear from AI researchers, data scientists, and machine learning engineers as they get technical about the most exciting developments in their field and the challenges they're facing along the way. I'm your host, Rob Stevenson, and we're about to learn how AI happens. Okay, hello again, all of my machine teaching data scientist darlings out there in podcast land. It's me, Rob, here with another installment of How AI Happens. It's an extra special installment because... I just went to this event and I'm just bursting at the seams. I'm just shaking. So I'm so excited to talk about it. Uh, I'm going to give some background on, on what this is all about. Basically, we are working on getting an episode recorded with the VP of AI research over at Meta, Joelle Pinot. She's amazing. She's a total rock star, published a ton of papers. She was working on generative before it was cool, uh, all that. And as part of that, I was working with Meta comms. And they were like, hey, you know what? We're going to be doing a, a press event for the 10-year anniversary of FAIR. FAIR is, of course, Meta's AI research arm. And I don't know if you if you all are familiar with FAIR, but basically they just have this like unlimited resources and a mandate to work on cool stuff. <laughs> and they are working on really, really cool stuff. And so part of this event was the folks over at Meta were just demonstrating what they've been working on and giving us updates on their models. And maybe it makes me look naive to admit how much my mind was blown <laughs> by this stuff. I didn't know some of this stuff was going on. Maybe y'all are a little bit hip to that jive, but I'm just so excited to talk about it. And what I wanted to do is before we have that episode with Joel, I wanted to bring in a subject matter expert from Sama to react to some of this stuff so I could report what I saw and then we can translate it into what it means in a more technical sense. So in order to do that, I have brought on a friend of the show, returning champion and the director of machine learning over at Sama, Jerome Pasquero. Jerome, welcome to the podcast. Hey, Rob. It's nice to see you again. You as well. Welcome back to the podcast, I should say. And with a uh, with a shiny new title, you've been promoted since the uh, the last time I had you on. So congrats. All right, thank you. Let's get right into it here, Jerome. One of the first things that stood out to me was this segment anything model. And it is basically annotation, but the bounding box is more specific and it's automatic. As so much computer vision is trained on segmented images, this was very exciting because it looks like, oh, that's just an automated way to do it. So I was curious, you know, I'm sure the folks out there listening are familiar with uh, Segment Anything. It wasn't launched at um, at this event, obviously. It came out a few months back, but uh, they were showing some of the progress it's made. I was hoping you could kind of react to Segment Anything and whether you think this is something that is more for the consumer or is this something that can, like, replace the way we train some computer vision models? Yeah, great question. So it's a little bit of both. And and we refer to it as SAM. We've been following SAM for quite a little while, right? It's a really impressive uh, model or set of models. And, and it does like uh, not only like give you the bounding box, obviously, but also kind of like the, the polygons around the objects, right? Uh, of course, like everyone else, we've experimented with it a lot. And it's it's uh, very impressive in the results and, and how granular it can be. Now, um, it doesn't do everything though, right? Uh, in the sense that uh, you might get the polygon around the object that you're trying to detect, but then you have no idea about the attributes of that object, for instance. It's a little bit more difficult to do that. Uh, and also, it's really good on objects that it's seen before, and it's massive data set of object, objects it was trained on. Um, but like for stuff that it hasn't seen that much and it's a lot more specialized, uh, we found that sometimes it, uh, it failed or required a, a human supervision, which is something that we actually uh, do provide at, uh, at Sama by making sure that we can correct these uh, these smaller, sometimes large errors that uh, such a model uh, will make. So a good example of that, like you were talking about whether this is helpful for like or useful in a consumer or, or more in a, an industry uh, mode. In industry, if you think of detecting all the different parts of a uh, printed uh, electronics uh, circuit, um, it might not do as well on this, uh, especially if it's got multiple multiple layers and multiple <laughs> types of, of chips on it, and it, uh, it, because it's, it hasn't seen as many right in the real world. It might do a really good job on 90% of the components, but that other 10% is just as important as the first 90%, and that's where uh, it might fail. But if we're talking more in the consumer world, like, you know, 
um, uh, presumably the data set that they used was mostly uh, pictures of like um, selfies or <laughs> uh, nice uh, scenery. Uh, that's probably where uh, we see the, the best results in, in this uh, automatic segment segmentation. Right. So th the more specific the segmentation would need to be and the more attribute rich, the more you would need some more human annotation going on is the idea, right? Or the more, uh, I would say, specialized, right? Like it's always comes back to how much of that particular type of features or specificity as it's seen in its training data set, right? The training data set that is that they use that is available, it, even if they collected some of it, presumably uh, doesn't have a, you know, a perfectly uh, equally distributed uh, classes across the board, right? So uh, some objects that it hasn't seen very often, it might not be able to segment them as well. And there are lots of lots of, of, of use cases in indus industry where, you know, it's very important to be able to do very well on these objects that are not commonly uh, seen. The segment anything model follows a lot of widely available AI right now, which is that, oh, it gets you you know, 60% of the way there, it like can take away some of the boring stuff. So say you were to, you wanted to use it for a very detailed, complex industrial application, right? You run this segment anything model and it gets the first obvious stuff out of the way, right? It's like, oh, that's, you know, that's a microprocessor. Great. Something obvious so that the annotator can be more efficient, right? It's like, now I don't spend half of my time doing the really, really obvious stuff that like a toddler could point out. Um, now I can only focus on the stuff that only I can do, which this is the goal of a lot of current tech, I think, where we are. Is that fair to say? Yeah, it's correct. Yeah. So it's a great tool to get the easy stuff uh, out of the way. But uh, as I mentioned earlier, um, you're still going to have errors or things that need to be modified. There's things that like the requirements that are different for a particular uh, company for a particular use case, right? So that's where the annotator still has a huge uh, role to play. And, 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 and and that's probably the most important role, right? Because uh, using SAM uh, is is almost off the shelf today, so it won't give you any competitive edge as a, as a company to use it, right? In your particular application, it's it's when you like start dealing with how do you deal with the specificities about your use case in your business that that, that you might get the, uh, the the competitive edge and get the efficiencies uh, the uh, gains that you're looking uh, after. So just to come back to yeah the 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 annotation at this level, we just get. All of the easy stuff out of the way. Uh, we need ways to identify what went well and what didn't go well and what needs to be uh, um, modified. So say, you know, it didn't quite uh, capture uh, a chip uh, properly. It didn't uh, get the legs of that, uh, you know, the little legs of that chip, whereas for that particular application, it's needed. Um, and then, like, as I said, it's often, um, it's not only about segmenting the object. We also have a number of attributes that are very important for that object. And that's some um, doesn't give you those attributes and those can be very very detailed think of like uh, whether there's a small flaw or not on that on that chip whether uh, it's a particular model of chip whether I you know you can think of a number of different uh, sometimes up to a hundred attributes for one just one object that we we annotate and for that uh, we haven't seen any uh, alternatives to using uh, a human annotators today. Eventually, probably the models might be able to capture all these intricacies about the properties of the object itself, uh, but uh, it's never going to be able to capture all of them because, again, they're very specific to a particular application and business. Uh, and even if they did, there's still going to be errors, and these errors need to be uh, corrected by um, uh, either a domain expert or, or someone at least who's been trained in identifying the pos potential errors that the machine learning algorithm can make. Yeah, of course. There is that gap between automation and expertise slash specificity. Uh, I've noticed that even like with using chat GPT. I've noticed it getting a little bit worse, and I've noticed... Uh, it's, it was just not ready. The output is just like 50% of the way there, right? It's a good start. It takes away the obvious stuff, but there's still a lot more that needs to be added to it. You're right about, about your, your analogy with that, with ChatGPT. I mean, like, there's a lot of talk about like human augmentation. Some people believe in it. Other people don't believe. I'm in the, uh, in the, on the team who, who believes that this is what we're trying to do over here. Like uh, human augmentation just allows humans to do things uh, better, faster, and get rid, at least for now, of the things that can be automated, but nothing, not, not everything will be automated. And then just, uh, it allows the human to kind of, uh, climb that ladder of cognition, like in terms of, of skills that they can, they can do, uh, and, and let the, the, the more tedious, uh, uh, work be done by the machine learning, uh, algorithms as they become available. Yes. 
Uh, and that the, the human augmentation seems to be what Meta is focusing on. Certainly with the Ego Exo 4D stuff, this stuff is amazing. I was really, really excited by this. Basically, you will use your Quest headset, right? Your VR headset. And then you watch someone perform a task and it could be fixing a toilet. It could be playing the xylophone. It could be swinging a tennis racket. And then the motions you're meant to take are projected in a hologram from your point of view over your body. So you would move your body in the way that you are seeing. And this is how a lot of learning takes place, right? It's monkey see, monkey do. I watch my tennis instructor volley a tennis ball and I try and move my body exactly like they did. And I listen to what they're saying and then I copy their emotions. That feels like this more immersive augmented version, basically like of masterclass, you know, it's like, uh, if I could just be, if I could have that person in the room with me and if I could move my body in that way. So that is, uh, what's going on with ego XO 4 D and it's really exciting. There's also, it, it seems like it's almost coming for the how to section of YouTube. Um, and one of the speakers was like, when was the last time you use a how-to video on YouTube. And I was like, last week, all the time. And last week I was trying to sharpen some knives in my kitchen. And I watched this video of the chef showing me how to sharpen knives. And I had to, there was this one section of it. I had to go back and watch like 10 times because it was too fast. And there was, the angle wasn't great. And what I needed was Ecovacto 4D. What I needed was to watch that and to be able to slow it down and then for it to be projected in front of me so I could mimic it. And this in a way, feels like a more accurate measure of how learning happens, at least non-language based learning. Another thing that came up at this event was Jan LeCun was there. You know, he's a, he's an all-star, right? He's the chief AI researcher over there. He won the Turing award. He plays chess with Yoshua Bengio. Like that's the, that's the, you know, the, the arena he's playing in. And he was talking about how so much of machine teaching right now is language based. It's like annotated information fed into a model. And, but like the language is limited. And that's not how learning takes place everywhere. He gave the example of a human infant who doesn't have any language capability, but yet can learn really, really fast. And so his point was like, we're missing something. There is some version of processing going on that is not language based and it's fundamental to how not just humans, but all living things learn. And that is not a part of our technology right now. He didn't explicitly connect the dot to Ego XO4D, but it was faint enough like... I figure that must be what they're trying to do with Ego Exo 4D because that's what an infant is doing. It's like they're copying what they see in the real world. They're also experimenting and using their touch and taste and smell and all that. But I, I was curious if, if you would react to that idea, Jerome, that there is more to learning than language. And is that what we're missing in, in this, this machine teaching approach? Yeah, I think you're touching on something very important right now. <laughs> There's a stark contrast between how, you know, using Ego XO4D, for instance, to kind of train humans in a really close feedback loop, because that's how we learn, right? Like you do something, you do it wrong, you're adjusted in terms of your actions, and then that's how you learn. And like how really, and, and, and how that process can happen uh, pretty quickly, especially if, um, if that, uh, that feedback loop is, is very tight, right? Action, correction, reaction, and then you go, uh, uh, round and round again. A, a contrast between that, which you know, usually just requires a couple of iteration, unless you're trying to become a you know professional <laughs> tennis player, for instance, at a very high level. But other other than that, like to sharpening your knife, that happens uh, fairly quickly. I, I would assume so. Uh, it, so a contrast between that and how our models are learning today, which is, again, the same kind of idea through repetition, but we're not talking about like going through that loop two or three times. We're talking going through it like hundreds of thousands of times, yes. right? Which is kind of crazy, as you alluded to. And, and, and I heard uh, Yael Kuhn say that multiple times, like a child doesn't need a hundred thousand images of a fire truck to know what a fire truck is, right? <laughs> and they can even see it in a different uh, form. Like the fire truck might be a physical toy and they know what it is. It could be on the street and they know what it is. I think that's a, that's an example that I'm two dimensions. So as much as we ha we're seeing like huge uh, progress in, in AI, uh, thanks to deep learning most, uh, mostly, uh, we haven't solved it. Like it's, this is probably not the right approach, right? It is one component that, uh, is probably important in our whole system. It has a very important role to play. Uh, and, and that's super exciting, but we're still missing, uh, something here. I would also add that it's not only on the kind of like sensory processing front, but 
also uh, on, uh, on, on just the reasoning part, like on the, the level on top of that where we haven't solved the reasoning at all. Like uh, uh, even in uh, autonomous driving, which could, you, you know, we could say is, is pretty uh, advanced in, in terms of the processing of all the different modalities and everything, the, the model has no idea what it's doing right, and why it's making any decision rather than, than, than another. So, though, so anything that at the decision-making level is still kind of really open for, uh, for grabs here in terms of, uh, of research and, 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 and solutions. The other thing Jan pointed out was that it's not a data issue. It's not like, oh, if we had enough you know, annotated data, if we had enough language, we could do it because very quickly to, to train at, you know, these at billions of units, of billions of, uh, uh, of points of data, you very quickly run out of the entire corpus of text that's ever been recorded by humans, right? Not only that, but it's like you're approaching the problem in the reverse order than one would expect because you're starting from uh, the data, which is the manifestation of a reasoning process and reverse engineering it to try to understand uh, the, the, the key mechanisms that dictate this, uh, <laughs> the, the system, right? Uh, now it's working. In some way it is working, but uh, it, it requires still so uh, much resources and computational power that uh, there's got to be something better because this is not how we, we work as humans, right? The, the, uh, the ultimate goal is to be able to do it the other way around, like to have these uh, fundamental uh, concepts from which we can extract uh, all the different uh, skills that we have uh, downstream, right? Um, so, and, and you're right in the sense as well, like people are starting to worry, like if we grab all the text on the internet, uh, not only is it, it's huge, but it's not infinite, uh, and it is also yeah. a closed ecosystem, right? It's a closed system. So we're not actually adding new information to what is used for training our models. Are we, are, are we in, at risk of, of being stuck in, in kind of, I don't, I don't know if I'd call it an infinite loop, but a, in a vicious circle where like we're just rehashing the same information over and over and over and over again and never learning anything new, right? Um, and that includes all the biases and from, 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 from that data that we have right uh, which uh, through this process only gets um, uh, uh, enhanced <laughs> right yeah yeah and it's just it would have all the same problems humans do yeah even and and the worst problems would be uh, augmented like they would be exaggerated, exaggerated. Yeah, yeah exactly this is also the importance it sounds like with the ego xo4d with thinking beyond language of just multimodality and lots of different types of data because going back to the child the human infant they learn by watching, they learn by touching, they put thing, everything in their mouth. If you've ever had a, been around a baby, just goes right in the mouth, right up the nose, um, all these things. So uh, that surely is under-indexed upon. I mean, we see it a lot in, uh, in autonomous, this idea of sensor fusion, right? That there's some sort of balance to all of the intake and that we can achieve sensor nirvana and have the most optimal um, path based on all of this information. That's still all vision into text though right so what is multimodality's place in in improving teaching do you think yeah i think that's one of going to be one of the, the main area of research that uh, everyone's going to be interested in over the next few uh, few years because as you said like humans are really good at processing different modalities and just using it as uh, not only kind of a redundant signal, like if you see something and you touch it, then, you know, <laughs> it, it feels like it touches and it touches like it feels like it's probably what you think it is, right? Uh, but but also just as a way to help with the reasoning, like the, the higher level on top of it. Um, so uh, today, as you said, it's kind of like a little bit at the uh, its infancy. We are starting to see models such as, uh, you know, ChatGPT or solutions such as ChatGPT that can take multi-model uh, input and, and create multimodal uh, outputs of so text and, and vision most of the time. But the reality is that there's a lot more senses. One that I'm specifically or very interested in is, is haptics because my background is actually in haptics, right? So as you said, uh, kids put stuff in their mouth and they learn from it. But if we come back to the uh, example of the kid learning what a fire truck is, well, by touching that fire truck, there's also information in there that they're using to actually understand this. So I'm not sure what form this is going to take. I leave it to the researchers to figure it out. Like, 
what else they, you know, what other mechanisms they can help for fusing all, all that uh, different, uh, all those different uh, modality or signals from different modalities. But again, I don't think that today we've really um, uh, nailed it. Like we, we're starting to see ways to to, to fuse these things. Like uh, you know. Um, and it's been around for a few years if you think of stuff like clip embedding, but it's not really a, a, a purely uh, a, a fusion like humans would do uh, and would leverage when they're, they're trying to learn. So something that came up right away, Joelle sort of kicked off the event and she said that self-supervised learning is the foundation of every model at FAIR. And that was surprising to me. Maybe it's not surprising to you. <laughs> is it? Is it? I guess I should start there before I, you know, ask a hackneyed question. Uh, no, it's not very surprising. Like, um, you know, with the emergence of like foundation models and, or stuff like uh, SAM, like these large, uh, large mat mo models, um, they have been trained uh, on uh, using a self-supervised uh, learning techniques just because it allows them to process so much more <laughs> uh, data that doesn't need to be manually annotated or annotated by humans, right? Um, so I think that in that sense. Uh, um, she's right. It's difficult to say that uh, Joelle is, is not right, but that when we're talking about these generalist models that can do things, can do a lot of, you know, things pretty well, uh, uh, we're going to continue to see a trend in, in using self-supervised uh, self techniques on raw data. Uh, the, the problem really is when you're trying to get those big models uh, to do stuff that's very specific, like we were talking about before, right? Uh, and most of the time you need to, to fine tune them. And, and in that fine tuning process, you still need, uh, data that often doesn't exist out there, right? And that's the kind of data that is specialized and needs to be labeled, labeled with a high level of expertise and accuracy. So I, I still think there's a very important role for, for humans uh, uh, there. That's what I wanted to ask because Self-supervised learning, it feels like a way to say unsupervised learning that's just a little easier to swallow. Like, surely someone has to come in and babysit this thing at some point. Like, there's got to be a role for humans in the loop. It's not just let this thing run. So maybe that is a question for Joelle. It's like, what does that mean for something to go from supervised learning to self-supervised learning? What is the difference in the parlance and how much intervention and monitoring is really still going on? I'd be curious to hear about that. Yeah, for sure. Me too. I mean, like, uh, that's definitely something I'd love to hear her uh, comment about. Like, what is the role for humans? I, I believe it will go in the direction, not to put uh, words in her mouth, of saying like, just for fine tuning, we still need uh, humans, but also for just making sure that everything is still working as expected. Because um, machine learning uh, uh, models today are very bad at that, at, at, at kind of like uh, uh, regulating themselves, like not regulating, but validating that what they're, they're, they're outputting is right. <laughs> they only know what they know. So, and <laughs> so, so you need an external factor or an, exter an external entity to actually uh, make sure that what they're outputting makes sense in the real world, right? Uh, and that today, there's no alternative to that than to use humans because we live in this world, we know it better than anyone else. And actually, the applications that we're going after are for us so we're the ultimate judge on whether you know the output of a model whether it is at a classification level super simple task today or as something much more complicated is the right output uh, I, and I don't see a way out of this now today you can use more powerful bigger models to kind of keep an eye on those smaller models but ultimately who's actually supervising these big powerful Who's models watching it's the watch exactly yeah. it's still it's still us that's what I wanted to get at it because it's like I've Maybe I can get Joelle to concede that self-supervised learning just means marginally less supervised learning. I think it's it's just yeah, ultimately like and and it's it's scary to think that at some point, you know, humans won't be supervising the models because then like that's where we get into that this today, which is still in a kind of sci-fi uh, world, yeah. but I like the models taking over, right? Um, and not, not to forget, this is still just a technology uh, uh, like any others. It's a more powerful, more, but it is still a technology. And the reason why we have technology is just to make our lives easier, right? So the, the goal in all of this is just still to help humans. So they have to be the ultimate judges as to whether it's helping them or not, right? Yeah. Before I let you go, Jerome, I want to outsource some of my interviewing to you <laughs> and ask you what, what you would like to, you know, to hear Joel comment more on, because um, we're going to have a more technical conversation, of course. What are some you know, follow-ups? What would you like to, to know more from Joel? Yeah, I think we touch on those. Like, uh, so I, I'll I'll make sure to listen to that episode for sure. So I can't, I can't wait for it. I I'd say that like I would ask her about what she sees as the whole role for humans, humans in the loop, 
uh, in the future, um, in few future applications. Like, uh, um, and you know, it's always hard to predict, but I'm sure she has an opinion on this. So this is definitely something uh, interesting. We also talked about uh, multi uh, modality. Like, what are the first modalities we're going to go after, for instance? And and are there new ideas around how we can fuse them other than and just like what we're doing today is pretty much concatenating them together, right? And just like putting pieces together. Are there better uh, other ways to do that? And and then a large question, but what is she most excited about? Because uh, um, that is always a great question for people like us who listen and then get inspired about like where to put our our chips right <laughs> on the on the table in the, in the in the future. Because if if a researcher of that caliber is excited about something, uh, there's a better chance that it's going to happen than if, if they're not. Right. So <laughs> it's a little bit purely. <laughs> yeah. Uh, um, but yeah, I, I'd go around those uh, those uh, themes for sure. Okay. Yeah. Thanks, Jerome. That's great. And I'll definitely ask her that. I'm excited to hear what she's excited about too, because they have kind of unlimited resources. They can work on anything they want. So like, how do they choose, you know, when you are, you know, a kid in a candy store and you can do research on whatever application you want, then you probably pick something pretty awesome. And that's what I saw at the event. So um, Jerome, this has been really fun uh, shooting the breeze with you about all this stuff and unpacking what I saw over there. So thank you for putting a little bit more of a technical bend on it. Uh, I appreciate you being here with me. This was really fun. It's always a pleasure to talk to you, uh, Rob. So uh, anytime. And to all of you out there listening, uh, if you want to know some more, I'm doing a a, a lengthier, more in-depth write-up on the Sama blog where I will have some of the content I captured. I have some video of Jan Lacoon. I have a bunch of um, a bunch of pull quotes from people who were chatting. There's some media that we received as being part of the event. So we'll mention uh, some more of the models that they debuted and uh, and what's exciting about it. That's all over on the blog. And yeah, thanks for tuning in. Uh, until next time with Joel Pinot, I've been Rob Stevenson. Jerome Pasquero has been Jerome Pasquero. And you've all been amazing, wonderful machine learning engineers, AI specialists, data scientists, whomever, however you showed up. Thank you for being here. Have a great one. How AI Happens is brought to you by Sama. Sama provides accurate data for ambitious AI, specializing in image, video, and sensor data annotation and validation for machine learning algorithms in industries such as transportation, retail, e-commerce, media, medtech, robotics, and agriculture. For more information, head to Sama.com.